to probably teach this if that weren't part of it. Um, Goldberg crossed it off and he was teaching it because he didn't feel comfortable, obviously, with it. But uh, I think it's, uh, <laughs> it is uh, an in, uh, <coughs> indispensable aspect of modern Jewish thought. I don't know how you could teach a modern Jewish thought and, <laughs> and dispense with that. It's like uh, throwing out a basic element, you know, uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. That's where we're at. That's the zeitgeist of the moment like it or not. So, uh, who knows? Let's, um, the deal will continue here and then we'll talk about the exam later on, okay? So we're looking at uh, Geiger's material on page 50, uh, where are we now? Uh, about 64 to 65. Oh, well you see now, um, I have, uh, I'm afraid I skipped some of the material earlier here about Geiger, I really should go back uh, to, this is his Science of Judaism material there, but, oh well, let's finish this and then go back to his introduction to his uh, prayer book material. So, um, let's see. I'm not going to read a lot of this, so I'll just pick up a few sections. Uh, for instance, here. Page 66, the science of Judaism is a study of the particular orientation of the spiritual life through which within one particular sphere Judaism was founded, developed, broadcast, preserved, and full vigor down our own time. Okay, sounds very impressive. You get the idea. Or, for instance, on page 69. A part of the science of Judaism, a study of history, will of course remain subject to all those <coughs> laws which history recognizes as science. I didn't know history was a science. In Germany, I guess it is. <laughs> Uh, I never, I know lots of historians, but I wouldn't call them scientists. Anyway, they do their best, they try. Scientific critical study must not be hindered by dogmatic assumptions. Well, we agree on that. Judaism has no cause to fear an unbiased critical examination. And I think we all could agree on that. So, there's nothing wrong with studying Judaism in a critical way. Then he goes on, the history of Judaism can be divided, at bottom 69, into four periods. The first is the Revelation period. And we know what that is, the Mosaic period. The second is the era during which all, this is top of uh, 70, all of this biblical material was process shaped, molded for life. It was then that Judaism took root in the spiritual heritage of the past. All very high fluting, isn't it? I wish it were all so elegant this. At the same time, still maintain a certain degree of freedom and approach. This was the period of tradition. So this is all very neat in his mind. As you know, uh, the Talmudic period is the period after the fall of the temple when these oral traditions were put into written form and discussed in what are called the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud, which is much smaller. The Jerusalem Talmud being the discussions in the Palestinian sphere and the Babylonian Talmud basically doing the discussions in the Babylonian and the memories of the Palestinian sphere. Uh, now, the third period is characterized, and he's judgmental here, by a toilsome preoccupation with the heritage as it then stood. The spiritual heritage was guarded and preserved. No one felt authorized to reconstruct or develop it. I think he's right there. I mean, it did get frozen. And the Talmud period was, like it or not, an attempt to develop things further. This was the period of no one dared go beyond the limits, and Islam is like that, and I think Christianity was like that probably in the medieval period. This was the period of, of this is what Islam is still suffering from today. They're having a terrible time dealing with it, and now if you try to change it, you can get your head cut off. So, uh, you know, there's intimidation and brutality mixed together. This was the period of rigid legalism, uh, spree, the era which was devoted to the summing up of what had been handed down. The fourth period is, of course, our own time. Our own time is always the best time, isn't it? Why is it always the best time? Because we live in it, that's why. This is the age of enlightenment. We're all living in the best time, the enlightenment time. Well, you know, I wish it were true, but maybe it is or maybe it isn't has been marked by an effort to loosen the fetters of the previous errors by means of the use of reason and historical research. However, the bond of the past has not been severed. What basically we're attempting to do is to revitalize Judaism, 
cause the stream of history to flow forth once again. This is the area of critical study in our modern era. I don't think that's a bad program, frankly, what he announces there. The only question is what he considers to be, uh, you know, uh, the new direction of things. And then here in 74, he evaluates the Talmud, the bottom of 74, the Jerusalem Gemara, the second part, that is, the Gemara means completion. You have the Mishnah, which is the oral traditions that were put down in the second century, and then the Gemara is what was uh, the finished discussions of these things. It's bare, meager, sober, and has a lot of legend and superstition in it. Um, the Talmud, as he goes on to say uh, further down on 75, I'm skipping here, is not by any means identical with the science of Judaism. Nor does it contain that science, even basically or specifically. But the Talmud has to be examined uh, in the light of critical uh, study. Uh, for we're dealing with reports which in part have adopted foreign components. I suppose you'd say the same about Christianity. This is an extensive task of critical study, but it is rewarding. So we're into the air where he wants scholarship to develop. Uh, we want to learn about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the contrast the two, and so on and so forth. Okay, I think we get that. That's the program of the Wissenschaft of, of Judaism. Let's go back to uh, the introductions to these prayer books. That we have back on page 51. And I think this gives us a good... Uh, you understand a little bit of the science of Judaism school, how it expresses itself. Here on 51 is the Association of Reformed Judaism. The proclamation of the Association. This is really getting uh, into serious uh, you know, organizational aspects. Uh, I don't know what the date of this is. Does he give, give it a date? I can't see a date. Well, let's assume it's somewhere in the 1810s. 18 teens or something like that, after the cease and so I guess it is associated with uh, uh, Jacobson. Our inner faith, the religion of our hearts, page 51, is no longer in harmony with the external forms of Judaism. Well, that's a fair statement. Probably even today, a lot of Jews, if I asked my own children, they would say that to me. We want a positive religion, meaning they meant by positive rational reasonable religion, logical positivism. They didn't mean positive or negative. They didn't mean it like that. We want Judaism. That is a, 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 a theory of Judaism. We hold fast to the spirit of Holy Writ, and which we acknowledge as a witness of divine revelation. We, we hold fast to the idea that Judaism teaching of God is an eternal truth. We hold fast to the promise that this teaching will someday become possession of all mankind. There's the mission to all mankind, which I think is, uh, is uh, really a little bit you know, pretentious and uh, over-optimistic. <laughs> I don't think we're going to teach uh, the Muslims or the Buddhist world or any other universe the spirit of, uh, of Judaism. That would be ludicrous. And why should anyone want to? We can no longer pray honestly for the messianic kingdom on earth, which will bring us back to the homeland of our forefathers. There it is. There it is. There it is. There's tossing out the national characteristics of Jews. We just want it to be a religion. We don't want it to be a people, and therefore we can't think of returning anywhere. That would bring us back to the homeland of our fathers. This is the anti zionist Pretending that we would return to, you see, the, the prayer for the return to Zion is, is where Zionism gets its name from. And, and that is the prayer for the return of the homeland. I told you what Zion was. Do you recall what Zion was? I told you. Zion is the seat of the Davidic monarchy in Jerusalem. Mount Zion is where the Davidic family was uh, considered to reside in Jerusalem. It's a small hill next to the uh, center area of Jerusalem. Maybe it's about 
500 meters from the Temple Mount. There's a monastery on it today. But there's also a tomb there, considered to be King David's tomb. Um, so we can't pray for the Messianic Kingdom. Christian brothers may pay, pray for that, but we can't do it anymore. Pretending that we should one day return from a strange land. The very father under which we are tied with bonds of love. We can no longer recognize as a code and unchangeable law book, the Mosaic law that is, which maintains with unbending insistence that Judaism task, Judaism task is expressed by forms which originated at a time which is forever past and which will never return. Well, you know, those are modern views. Those are the spirit of that time that they lived in. They're very modern. And actually, on the face of it, that idea that to live by a third millennium, second millennium BC system of laws is ridiculous in the nuclear age. I think we see it even more and more ridiculous today than then that we should be bound by that. There's not, no reason not to pay some homage to it, but that we should be bound by that is really, um, is really sort of to move into a kind of um, um, what are those people in uh, southern Pennsylvania where that terrible shooting just uh, happened? An Amish situation, yeah. I mean, it's all very admirable what they do, but you know, most people can't remain frozen in time. I mean, you can try, and if you want to, you can do it, but for the majority of people, we can't. And you know, the Amish may like it, but someone's got to go out and fight the battles for this country <coughs> to defend the way of life. We use modern equipment, modern technology, fly the airplanes and so on, develop the industry. You know, we all can't ride around horse and buggies, or we might like to. We'll soon be overrun by someone else. So, you know, we protect them, really. Give them protection. We're willing to. That's fine. But, you know, not everyone can do that. In Israel, the same thing. Everyone can't be sitting worshiping at the wall. If everyone's worshiping at the wall, they'll soon be all slaughtered. You know, someone's got to go out and do the dirty work. You say, well, oh, my God, I forgot about that. Yeah, well, you know, let's, let's be honest. All these people in the ivory towers and other things that they like to inhabit, they live at the leave of others who have to go out and do the dirty work, who defend them and allow them to sit in the ivory tower. Come on. And most of us are willing to do that, as long as it doesn't get overburdensome. In Israel, it's a huge battle going on. On this issue, but how burdensome is it that the religious groups um, can get uh, exempt from the army, for instance, in order to study the, the Torah and yeshivas? That really annoys the other population. There are a lot of religious people who do fight in the army, or a lot of people who keep calling and stuff like that. But there's a Hasid, Hasidic groups who don't. You know, and others like that. Well, I can assure you that, that that does not make them very popular in the general population. These people have to go out and risk their lives, and they don't. You know, it just doesn't it just doesn't go down. Basically. So, um, you know, we can say we'd like to live in a third millennium BC manner and not change anything. But we, if we all did that, we would be overwhelmed by people who didn't. And we can't, and we can't do that. Not all of us, anyway. So again, he's recognizing that. I guess this is not Geiger here. This is still Jacobson or his uh, associates. But you see, they are throwing out right away the national characteristics. Why? The same as Mendelssohn's people are doing in their conversion, and Marx is found, and uh, you know, Disraeli's father converted him too. Uh, and Heine's father, Heine himself rather, uh, Hitler wouldn't allow Heine to be read anymore in Germany, even though he was their greatest lyric poet. And he's a really interesting person, Heine Kind. That's also a, a, a subject that's well worth enough uh, research if you're interested in someone like that. He's a really interesting person.
Um, so, you know, they are throwing away the national characteristics. Now, the second part, I think everyone can agree, or at least most people of goodwill can agree, we have to do some upgrading if we're going to not lose our children, if nothing else. So when they adopted, you know, choirs, organs, uh, pews, uh, I think not many people would object to mixing men and women, even though Orthodox Judaism still does not mix men and women in the synagogues. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's good or bad to do it. I'm not sure what aspects of Judaism should or shouldn't be returned. I, I am not the arbiter of these things. I couldn't possibly tell anyone what you should retain. Because I have to be honest, if you want personally what I feel to be myself to be, a secular Jew. And uh, I'll do my religious expression in my own way. Whether it is uh, looking at herons or some other beauty, etc. But uh, I'm not going to abandon the tradition of the, uh, of the people who struggled so hard to bring it down to this period. I don't feel I have the right to do that. Uh, but I'm not necessarily going to, uh, you know, ex express any of it myself personally, because I'm not sure what is an elemental form and what I'll join in solidarity with people if they want. I'm not against it. But I don't know what is the right or wrong thing to keep, what's intrinsic or what isn't. So I think we can agree with him that something has to be done, and, and, and what they want to do is to do it in a somewhat scientific manner. But you see, the first thing he started out with wasn't done scientifically. He didn't study what the effects of throwing out the, uh, the prayer for the return to Zion would be on the morale and uh, spirituality and uh, 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 psyche of the people. He just said, oh, we don't want that anymore. You know, I don't think that that is done in a particularly uh, you know, scientific manner. So finally, the conclusion is, in this particular one, uh, we who are deeply committed See, he says the, uh, I suppose we should say, um, this other form of Judaism maintains that Judaism test is expressed by forms which originated in a time which is forever past which will never return. We are deeply committed to the sacred continent of our religion. Can we <coughs> hope to sustain it, its inherited form, or even less can we hope to hand it to our descendants? Thus placed between the graves of our fathers, cradles of our children, we are stirred by the trumpet the sound of our time. Zeitgeist. It calls us to be the last of the great blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now we, that's the Declaration of Reform Judaism. Let's look at the introduction of the Berlin Prayer Book uh, that is given here. And then we'll look at Abraham Geiger's introduction uh, to his, this is, this is already the mid-19th century. This is already 1848. Is it all right we look at this stuff? Do you mind? Uh, to, uh, page 52. To start with, this is a revised version of the of the of an earlier prayer book that had already been uh, revised from traditional uh, formats. The way and manner in which the chosenness and priestly vocation of Israel were expressed in our public prayers until now seemed to require a thorough reform. You see the reform, and this is you know we have to reform the particularness, national characteristics. This idea of chosenness is really outdated. And now I don't know if it is or it isn't. I'm just saying this is what they're saying. And which would be adequate to our religious convictions now, the, the, the spirit of this time, 1850. The chosenness of Israel as a holy priest people and as God's own possession appears in our holy scriptures a firmly established uh, historical fact, I don't know about that, uh, point of view, I would say. But it's really only a subjective fact, something, you know, uh, in uh, the religious consciousness. Maybe they could have thought of them, I'm paraphrasing here, themselves uh, as God's chosen, perhaps. Many Jews now say, yeah, chosen for suffering. Uh, I don't think most Jews like, uh, I think most Jews are pretty uncomfortable with that chosen idea, but, you know, I think they were using it more poetically back in the original times. I don't think they thought, oh, we're chosen, and so on, everybody's great here. I don't think they had an idea that everyone was great here. They just said that there's a vocation that we should have to, to be more spiritual if we can, to be more righteous if possible. Whether they all achieve that is something else. But, you know, Jews have, in large numbers, followed intellectual activity. 
and uh, they have, I think, you know, um, I don't want to generalize about how Jews are, but I, I don't think they're particularly cruel people. And they certainly aren't really big on physical violence in the family or, or physical violence against others. If they can fight an army, as you now have been proven, I don't think people realize in the 19th century that Jews could fight an army effectively. But now some people think they're one of the most effective fighting armies except for this last fiasco in Lebanon uh, <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that there is out there. So uh, I think that really surprised people. And that's just a matter of discipline and intellectuality and uh, uh, dedication and um, uh, sacrifice and commitment. But people didn't think that because they wouldn't go out in the play, the play uh, ground and box everybody or something like that or throw people in the trash bins that used to happen in my playground when I was in junior high. They used to have this thing of uh, trashing, trash binning people. And there were no teachers or anyone that would sit and run around and just grab whatever they can grab and throw them in trash bins. Uh, that, that was really fun. I don't think any Jews ever did that to people. You know, it's just some weird uh, mindset that you've got in this mass psychosis, uh, the way children sometimes are, who are undisciplined and un, uh, you know, who have experienced physical violence in the house. If they experience physical violence in their own house, they tend to inflict physical violence on other people. And I don't think there's any physical violence I've ever seen in most Jewish houses. Just not, it's just not in the, it's just not in the cars. They just don't do it. So anyway, so there may be some that, 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 so you know they try to be in a certain way. I don't think they're perfect. And I don't think they think of themselves. Uh, so, um, but as an objective fact, with all its important consequences for religion, this chosenness has lost its validity. I, I think some of us would agree. Yeah, obviously, the Orthodox could never assent to. So this is extreme reform Judaism right off the get-go, 1840s, 50s. Uh, the tri uh, concept of tribal holiness and special vocation arising from this, which made special purity laws and things, uh, has become foreign to us. And also the idea of an intimate covenant between God and Israel, which is significant for all eternity. That's foreign to us. So how would these ideas sit with uh, Orthodox Jews? I mean, maybe Orthodox Jews really don't believe this, but they wouldn't be able to ever say such things as you have here. So we're really getting a real split here. What you got in those pages there? What are you doing? Oh, nothing. Huh? Nothing. Well, take them Just outside and do it. Oh, well, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it distracts me, so I appreciate it if you, if you need to do it, do it outside, or just hold off for, uh, oh, i got a half hour more. Okay, the concept of, let's see what else we have here. Um, we consider um, man as chosen and closer to God as he exemplifies these gifts and witnesses to them through virtue. So, you know, more like what one might call in the old times adoptionist uh, baptism or sonship, that as you become more righteous, you become more like a son of God. So these uh, characteristics should be, uh, should be illustrated by... Uh, advances in righteousness. I don't think there's anything to, come to, to argue with them on those points. Let's look at Revelation. A revelation to us is the divine illumination of the spirit of our fathers which does not exceed the natural limits of human ability and which is therefore capable of continued development. So it's an ongoing thing. It can go on. Again, I don't think that the uh, Orthodox would like any of this, but I'm not sure it's so uh, offensive or even unreasonable or, um, uh, you know, out of touch with reality. I think it probably is in touch with some of it with reality. The question is, how far are they going to go and what are they going to discard? Uh, so some of this is expressed quite eloquently, I think you see. Consequently, when our sacred texts speak of a revelation which many of our fathers received in the course of supernatural events, we can only consider such texts in accordance with our religious conviction as a living expression of subjective faith. In other words, when we have the revelation on Mount Sinai before 600,000 people, that's okay, but it really is quite an incredible 
thing that you really want to believe in actuality. It's, as I said, more of a subjective. Uh, subjective means something within you to pay homage in some way, not an objective thing. So, uh, they're being very enlightened here, as you see. So what's the problem? Well, again, it's how far they go. Um, okay, the, this feeling filled with the power of inner truth invested our fathers with a sense of blessing. But for us, uh, we must deny its objective factuality. I think Christians are having the same problem with Jesus and the miracles and walking on water and the multiplication of the loaves and, you know, all of the how many fishes there are and all this sort of thing that you get in the Gospels that are characteristics of, you know, Hellenistic ancient literature. And if you want to uh, call those objective historical reality, I think you're going to be pretty hot water in the space age. Ah, you're welcome to the whole lot of them. There's nothing wrong with having, you know, being obvious. He's saying, or they're saying subjective religious reality. Again, I, I don't say they're wrong, and I'm not saying they're but they're, you have the same problem that they're having. That is that they are having a problem with some of these extravagant claims in the Old Testament. And I think any, any modern person who's on his computer is going to have problems with extravagant claims in the New Testament as well. But again, it's not for me to judge. That's for you guys who are uh, you know, inheritors of the New Testament. You have to decide those things. I, I certainly uh, can't do it. Okay. But they're, he's giving you, they're giving you a way out the way they did it in 1850. I don't think if it helps, it helps. It doesn't. Okay. Our ancestors in all the Jewish antiquity were thoroughly convinced that God, of whose holy being and will they had the noblest conception, had illumined their spirit and revealed to them the highest truths. They felt this so deeply that they could speak of the act of revelation with, with a living sense of immediacy. I guess, again, Christianity could say the same thing and uh, express itself in the same way as they're expressing it here. So you can read this yourself. The, the Ten Commandments, he goes on, you know, about the Revelation, are not more important or holy because they were revealed with some great miracle, if you like. Um, they're important uh, because uh, they are in themselves uh, a holy expression, if you like, of the human spirit. The divinely illumined human spirit is and remains the last source of judgment to decide which Revelation is greater or smaller. Look at here. Again, it's human spirit, the Geist. The spirit of maybe the time, our heritage. <coughs> okay. This allows us to view and revere the heritage they bequeath us as the inheritance of our fathers and to call the universal God the Father of all men, etc., etc. Et so, so now they're moving on to other aspects of this. This is written by the Committee of Editors in this uh, uh, introduction to the Bible Um. So. Hence our prayers quote whole passages from the Bible in which our ancestors' faith in immediate, apparently supernatural revelations expressed vividly and with great force. Okay, so we're going to quote some passages from the Bible where this revelation is supposed to have taken place. They're not saying they actually believe it was a revelation. They're just saying that it's so powerful and of such solemn uh, uh, importance that they're going to quote it. But they see, they, they call it... Um, uh, poetry. However, such poetry must not sully the purity and clarity of our religious consciousness. It's poetry anyway. Whether it's real is something else. Old and new prayers. What we have said applies to the old prayer as well as those which we have reshaped. They're going to make new prayers based on old examples, resembling old examples. Everywhere the national, and this is this is my only beef for them, and my only parting of ways as a modern person today. 21st century, instead of the mid 19th, where are we now? I would say we're 150 years later than this. Everywhere the national dogmatic, see, this was their guiding force. This is where I think that they had an agenda, which though they express it very nobly and eloquently, maybe led to really deleterious things. And I think it still is leading to deleterious things. Everywhere the national, dogmatically narrow aspects must give way to the living flow of purely human, truly religious thoughts. The same in Mendelssohn, the same here. All these high polluting notions of uh, 
religious thought is what we're supposed to represent and throw out the other things which are mean base and so on. I think that somehow the lower things that they think are so mean and base uh, are actually the things that inspire people's hearts. Now you can say as a Christian that the miracles inspire you and so on. I don't want to argue with you on that point. You'll have to decide what should be retained and what shouldn't. That's for you to decide. Uh, but I'm talking about Judaism now. And I don't mean to hurt any of your feelings when I say any of those things. But in, in Judaism, I think that the poetry of the Old Testament is what's inspiring. And some of the rubbish that they substituted in place of it is falls flat on its face. Because it's not poetic. And it doesn't uplift. And it's just cheesy, second-rate thinking. And you're not going to inspire young people with that kind of cheesiness. What you're going to do is maybe, uh, uh, with the Old Testament, at least you can inspire young people with the beautifulness of the expression and the, and the antiquity of it and the impressiveness of it, which is why I love to teach an Old Testament class in this university. Even though I don't, you know, believe half of what they say in terms of what they're attesting to. But that's okay. And then when they get into the prophets in the Old Testament, to me it's a shame that the Jewish people don't even read their own prophets. That Christians read more of the prophets than Jews do. And I'll give the Orthodox credit, at least they read some of the prophets. I don't know how well they understand the prophets, but at least they read them. Uh, the, or the Reformed Jews don't know anything about them. Anyway, for a noble, truly pious soul, the thought of the Father of all mankind is more stern than the God of Israel. Well, I don't think that's true. I don't think the thought of the Father of all mankind inspires anybody. The God of Israel at least is an understandable, inspiring historical event that moves people uh, with all of the past and the people who felt that way. I'm not trying to argue with you, I'm just saying what I think is, I, I, I praise their attempt to be high-minded and elegant, but I really part company with their conclusions, personally, and so therefore the reason I put them down, if you like, a little bit is that I don't think that uh, their conclusions were just motivated by oh, uh, an attempt to get along. <laughs> and uh, that, that isn't to me very noble. You, know, you can get along if you want, but it's not very noble. The image of God imprinted upon every human being is a, it's a covenant sign of divine love. It has more poetry than the chosenness of Israel. No, I'm sorry. That's not going to be what young people anyway are going to respond to, and it's not going to move me when I'm on my deathbed, I don't think. So, you know, that's just me I'm talking about. So they, they think that this is self-evident, but I don't think it is self-evident. That doesn't mean the orthodox approach is going to be the arbiter. I think we need really poetic, prophetical-minded people to express things in a poetic, prophetical-minded way if you're going to change anything. Otherwise, leave it the way it is. Because you're going to do more damage by your by your foolish changes than you are in letting it be. That doesn't mean you have to go around dressed like Hasidim or something, like if you're Amish or something. You don't have to go around in costumes from the 16th century. You don't have to meddle with the culture that you've inherited either, unless you've got something higher to replace it with, which these people obviously didn't. At least they couldn't express it in any high-minded way that would appeal to uh, spiritually, uh, uh, um, how should I put it, uh, inspiring, in a spiritually inspiring manner. Okay, and then that here, <laughs> it's hard for you to be so tough on this. Uh, you read it yourself, you make your conclusion, don't listen to me. The high ideals and sentiments are brought together, which in the purifying struggle and the battlefield of science has proved themselves the ideals and sentiments of the genuine Jewish spirit. This is so highfalutin, it's really like, it, it's very noble, but meaningless. We call special attention to those prayers which contain thoughts of the holiness of God and man, the priest invocation of Israel, the purified messianic ideas, the other. We want you to look at these things, in other words, and see how well we've done this. Well, I'm not sure they have. But in any case, let's go here to Abraham Geiger. And his introduction, which is, uh, as you can imagine, is, uh, as usual, more intellectual than some of these others. He's a smart guy, this guy here. And I have to say, I read that essay of his, Fasat Muhammad Aus den Juden, you know, 
what has Muhammad taken from the Jews? And I guess I did read it in English because I don't think I would have been able to get through a really good understanding of German. So there must be a translation of it out there somewhere because I read it in graduate school. Okay. What's his date on this one? He's got a date here. 1869, Frankfurt. Right after the American Civil War. Somewhere uh, towards the end of his life. He had three or four more years to live. He's a, a man of, of later in life. Are we okay here? You're following me, you guys? Okay. Here's his introduction to the prayer. The prayer work appearing here with hardly needs to be commended and introduced to the public, for which is meant. The liturgical, meaning the service uh, idea, has already for years occupied one of the foremost positions in the consideration of the task of adopting the historical form of Judaism to the man, to the demands of the present. So we get the idea. The historical school and all the others are trying to adopt Judaism to the demands of the present. Are they succeeding? Can they succeed? Will they succeed? Is what we'll have to decide for ourselves looking at this. The worship service is the bond which binds the congregation. Okay, nothing wrong with that. I think we'll grant him that. It means that the expression of religious conviction as alive in the individual as in the group you must not deny the connection with the totality of the historical past. You see, he is pretty collected. He does a much better job of expressing than the previous introduction, doesn't he? Uh, yet it must at the same time nourish the religious needs of the present. Okay, sounds good. The demands made upon the prayer book for our time are therefore so manifold and proceed with such divergent points of view that the publication of a prayer book which can satisfy all congregations at the same time simply cannot be undertaken. The divergences, etc., are too great. Okay, fair enough state. Down further, page 57. The prayer book has not been modeled uh, according to the theory of an individual. It has roots in history and is expressed in invitation of large congregations. Okay, so history is the thing still. For many years, next paragraph, the lack of a well-arranged prayer book, particularly for Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, we're still working on having the modern prayer, have been felt by the two congregations in Frankfurt. So, you see, that's all they really cared about, just like the modern prayer. Judaism in America, funnily enough, the bastion of Reformed Judaism is America. All this migrated to America, every single bit of it. But not the intellectual uh, further development. It was developed here, and it stopped here. I don't think Reformed Judaism, with all its efforts, has really developed any further than what he's talking about. And they've tried to go back a little bit and do this, but it's basically frozen in place. So does it appeal to the modern Jewish uh, community? Does it appeal to modern Jewish youth? I don't know. I can't judge. I know it doesn't appeal to my children. I'm not trying to make them appeal or not appeal, but, you know, I don't know what would appeal to them, so I can't say. Organized things that don't appeal to modern people that much. Modern young people, anyway, that I know. So I, I don't know. So I can't say, but... Um, Okay, uh, I'm just observing my own situation. Um, so, the principles 58 <coughs> were then formulated. They were combined in a memoir and, a pro and approved by the administration already in June 1869, blah, blah, blah. And here's uh, the principles that he's talking about. Uh, I guess it's signed by him here. To the worthy congregation, I submit this extensive plan on the principles of the commission. One, the prayer book should retain its customary character and uh, in a precise form express its connection with the history of Judaism. However, essential components, therefore, of the service, this is where Reformed Judaism is today, they read Hebrew occasionally, and the congregation understands nothing. The traditional uh, remains in Hebrew. The traditional Hebrew expression, though here and there, not free from a certain Oriental extravagance. So he's like, you know, he just sort of puts it down. You know, not that German isn't extravagant. It's, it's, it's worse as far as extravagance goes. It's on the whole untouched. You know, some Oriental extravagance. I don't think so. It's very compressed. 
he was not extravagant. It's the opposite. It's very you know, unextravagant, very compressed. Uh, King James English is very extravagant. German's very extravagant, but not Hebrew is very, uh, you know, very uh, un un unextravagant. Where was Hebrew at this time? In the prayers, in the Bible. Not used at all? No, no, not spoken. Not spoken. Right, let's see if we can get through this quick. Because I've got to, I've got to, nevertheless, particularly on the distinguished days, the service must contain a few German prayers, too. And uh, the Hebrew must be accompanied by a German translation or uh, paraphrase or adoption so that people understand. And I live in a Jewish uh, form temple, they have the Hebrew often on one side and English on the other side. And then occasionally they'll have some Hebrew mixed into it, in, you know, but they'll translate it again. And then, look, three, special care must be taken to re reduce the duration of the service. The Orthodox services are too long. Well, there is no service. No. Everyone just prays almost at their own rate. They go, blah, 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 blah. And you get, and there's no real organization at all. It's just almost all chaos, which is charming if you're used to organization. But these people in Germany say, oh my God, we can't have a religion like that. It doesn't look like Christianity, so we've got to change the whole thing around. It was really individuals prayed by themselves in Orthodox prayer service at their own speed. They just read through the prayer book at their own speed. Uh, unnecessary repetitions, unessential prayers must be admitted. Well, I've seen reformed prayer books, and there's repetition, endless repetition, of unessential prayers that, you know, I guess they've got to put something in the prayer book. I'm not sure what you should put. For me, I would just read the, read the Bible. That's all I would do. Read a portion of the Bible, and then next week read another portion. Because that's the elegance. These prayers that they concocted later on are not very inspiring. I don't know if everyone's ever seen a Passover prayer book at the Haggadah, they call it. How many have seen one of those things that they read at the Passover? It's, it's horrifying. I mean, it's rabbinic uh, stuff that really, um, you know, the only good stuff in it is when they repeat some of the poetry from the Old Testament. All the other stuff is uh, rabbinic, you know, uh, gobbledygook. And, uh, and it's totally boring to any children or anyone else who'd be sitting there. Adults aren't easily bored, so they just read it and get done with it. But children want to run out and play and do all kinds of other things. Uh, anyway, uh, Orthodox just go on at their own speed. They sort of, the people who can pray, pray. And, and no one expects anyone to listen to them, and no one expects anyone to, to join in with them. They all just pray along, uh, you know. And when they read an uh, Orthodox uh, prayer at the Passover, they just People are talking and conversing and enjoying themselves, and some one person may be going blah 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 Therefore, five, materialistic descriptions of the deity, personifications of the deity, uh, must be removed. Well, this is ridiculous. That's what people respond to, personifications of the deity. And he, who is that walking in the Garden of Eden? You know, we know it's not reality that God doesn't walk around in the Garden of Eden, but to put it that way is, ex is exciting. Put it. These people are ridiculous. You know. they, again, they're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. That is a huge problem. The enumeration, so then they're going to push people into total secularism, like many people who are Jewish that you know. And therefore, the next step is easily you're going into some other religious persuasion, which may or may not be the right way of doing things. Angelic orders cannot be admitted. Well, I have some sympathy with that because I think people misplace what they, this angel idea. The belief in an immortality must not content itself with the one-sided formulation of bodily resurrection. You know, it should be a more spiritual thing. Maybe there's something to that. You know, most people don't think that body is going to come out of the ground and went to the ants and eat it all up. Not many scientific-minded people would like to think that. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but I mean, you know, 
These people are being pretty cold, but I think the first thing is really the, the tough thing. How about the position of Israel in world history? We have to do it like this. Judaism is a religion of truth and light. Right, okay. To this is related, uh, and the bearer, and her, uh, Israel received this task and continues to be the barrel and herald of this doctrine. Oh, well, would it were true. To this is related his confidence that the doctrine will progressively become the common session of the entire, here's the Jewish mission to the world, to enlighten and, and bring light and so on. Therefore, seven, we must, that's the usual stuff, get rid of the national aspect. Well, they might have gotten rid of it, but Hitler didn't. See, I'm talking in the hindsight of history here. Hitler just pulled the pants down and looked to see who they were circumcised. <coughs> That's what he was interested in. He didn't care how they prayed or what they prayed. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, pretty gruesome, I admit. But, you know, these guys were living in a uh, dream world. I can't blame them, really. That's what someone said. What do you mean? It's a tough situation they're involved in, but I don't think that their solution is, uh, is, uh, is particularly uh, inspiring, put it that way. Separation between Israel and other peoples which exist at one time has no right to be expressed in prayer. Rather, we should express joy that such barriers are falling. The exalted feeling of noble spiritual vocation must avoid any appearance of overbearance. Look into the future should arouse the happy hope of the unification of all mankind. Come on, who's going to respond to that in a religious ceremony among people in a, in, in a congregation? Yeah, that's what you see in the form prayer books, even to this day. The holy faded from our consciousness is the belief in the restoration of a Jewish state in Palestine. Well, you see how wrong you can be. <laughs> you can't get much wronger than that. A hundred years later, there it was. And a lot of other suffering to do. Uh, you know, this is why uh, this is why I have uh, uh, some issues with this myself. You know, and consequently the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem to serve as the unification. You see, the Jews still haven't come to terms with that particular issue. Christians get to term, have come to terms with it, evangelicals and others much more easily than Jews because they don't have a problem. They just read the prophets. They know what they what they think of this. The Jews don't read the prophets, so they don't know what they think of this. Same with uh, Moshe Dayan, who left the Muslims in control of the Temple Mount, didn't pay any attention to the prophets. Good or bad, I don't know. But I think that a lot of political problems would have been solved if he had uh, not behaved less precipitously and considered the issue a little more carefully. The same applies to the belief in the gathering. Of, it wouldn't have become a rallying point now of Muslims as it has been. Muslims never paid much attention to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. <coughs> Mecca was their rallying point. Now everything is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. You never hear a word about Mecca. So powerful is modern propaganda. So he, in doing this, he created an issue rather than solving most of Diana. The same applies to the belief of the ingathering of the dispersed. Ah, oh, yes, but if they had that belief um, uh, more pronounced, a lot of them might have escaped more readily uh, what happened. And to everything connected with such a restoration of vanished circumstances, express them and see, you just can't change things helter-skelter without considering it, to my, in my view. Uh, the petition for its realization would be a blatant untruth. Similarly, the conception which envisions our worship service as sacrifice service is irreconcilable. Okay, I think most people would probably find that to be an acceptable proposition there. Something probably has to be done. Animal sacrifices no longer have the right, right to represent a desired institution. And uh, the memory of them, too, uh, probably has to be Remain free of the program. I'm not sure of that. You can certainly remember the past without without repeating it. Okay, I think you get the gist of this. There's another note here from Geiger, uh, 1869. I'll just read the beginning of it, then that's it. Just as there was agreement among the members of the commission and approval of the part of the administration of the congregation concerning the guiding principles and plan based upon them, so too have the most important German prayers, which are recited aloud and which are considered part of the public worship service, 
be determined in common, consul common consultation. However, I bear sole responsibility for the German prayers which are recited silently, as well as for the translations and so forth. So, you know, he wrote all this stuff. All power to it. This is not a great poet. He's a pretty good scholar. I don't think he's in position to redo a prayer. I don't know what he's in position to do, but that's just my own personal view. Now, <clears throat> I haven't had a chance to uh, deal with the um, with the uh, Zuntz material effectively. Now, let me just say a few things about about Zuntz and uh, Frankel, and then we will we'll call it a day if, if you don't mind. Um, so. Look, uh, a lot of these things uh, were shattered in 1848 by the uh, uh, uprisings that were put down at that time. And, um, you know, most of this material then moved over to America after, after that. Leopold Zunz, 1794 to 1886. Um, actually, he was German. Krokmal was the Romanian. I was wrong on that score was an orphan, studied Hebrew, uh, went to the University of Berlin, and so on and so forth. Um, he um, was one of the ones who felt that uh, we need to emancipate ourselves from within, that we have to be aware of the achievements of Judaism. And the knowledge of the, of the past inspired dignity and self-worth. He, he, he felt we needed to disseminate German culture. I think that uh, he's getting more to, I think, what a lot of people feel. Um, he studied the sermon and so on and so forth. Um, I don't know, hold on now. Um, I'm not sure if we're not speaking about Frankel here. This is, I'm, yeah, this is Frankel, I'm sorry. So it's, 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 no, no, this is us. This is us. Anyway, you'll find most of this material in uh, in Rudowski. Uh You can you can pick it up there. In 1834, he studied the sermon to see if that was a, an intrinsic element. Um, he uh, um, 1843 he studied the prayer. But mainly he felt that uh, these, uh, these were edifying and inspiring rituals that were essential to Judaism, outward reminders of abstract, reminders of abstract ideas, and that Jews shouldn't just barter for their rights. They are entitled to these anyway. I think that's a much more self-respecting approach, and that's what gives rise to this third school, Frankel, 1801 to 1875, the historical school. So I told you he was born in, uh, in uh, Prague, he studied in uh, Hungary, and uh, Rudowski goes into great detail on Frankel, Zachariah Frankel. Uh, he did studies under the Septuagint, the Mishnah, and so on and so forth. He was um, pretty influenced by the Romantic movement, uh, and again, he's one of these people, I think, that um, you had to follow the folks, guys, but you couldn't um, interfere with some of the eternal principles of, um, of um, Judaism. In any event, um, let's see. For him, there was a mystical and romantic folks Geist. And this, for him, developed into what we now call the historical school. And for him, the, the Vox uh, uh, Day were the Vox Popola. Vox Day is the voice of God, Vox Popola is the voice of the people. The voice of the people are the voice of, of God. And the Jewish people are the final arbiters of what is going to be considered the zeitgeist, if you like. They are the source of law and, tr and a tradition. Now, his student was a person called Solomon Schechter. Uh, uh, let's see, one more page. 
time before we. I want to just finish this up because we want to get this stuff before the exam. His student was a person called Solomon Schechter. Solomon Schechter was, I think, also from Romania. In any case, he went to England and became the reader in rabbinics at Cambridge University. Solomon Schechter also thought that the, uh, the congregation of Israel was the ar ar arbiter of all change. Uh, something like the, the evolution of uh, rabbinic thought. You had to look at the living tradition. Uh, the Hebrew messianic hope, etc., uh, of these kinds of, of, of future events were foundations of the positive historical Judaism. They defined the Judaism the nat in national ethnic terms. <coughs> Judaism for these people, uh, Schechter and um, Frankel, um, were really was uh, the religion of the Jews. That's what Judaism was. Frank uh, Schechter's uh, dates, by the way, are 1847 to 1916. Uh, and uh, he, he is extremely important because at the time he was reader in rabbinics at Cambridge, the, the Cairo Geniza was found. Uh, this is in the 1890s, uh, 1897. This is one of the hidden manuscripts from the Middle Ages. Were found. He went to Cairo as a scholar of rabbinics from Cambridge, read all this material, brought it all back to Cambridge. Because he became so famous, he was invited to America. And he became the first president of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And he basically founded conservative Judaism in America. So out of all this thinking, Geiger and his associates went on to be the founders of Reform Judaism. Krogmal, Zuntz, Frankel, Schechter developed the traditions of the positive historical school, uh, which went into what we call the reaction to Reform Judaism. Which was, so conservative Judaism is not a reaction to Orthodox Judaism; it's a reaction to Reform Judaism. But still, it's an attempt to apply historical principles, but not throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think this is why conservative Jews are more comfortable in their religious expression. But I, again, I'm not sure which is the, I think more people are move, in, Reform Judaism has now moved towards the direction of conservative Judaism. Uh, I don't know which is finally the inspiring Judaism that will move new generations and move forward in the future. I'm not sure that that's been written yet. I'm not sure it's ever going to be written. But that's where things stand at the moment in terms of religious development among the Jews. Nothing has moved very far forward from these, uh, from these positions, except that Reform Judaism has moved a little bit back towards conservative Judaism. Having said that, what about our exam? Sorry to give you unpleasant uh, uh, things, but uh, we'll have two out of three questions, and we'll have uh, six or so, like I usually do, short identifications just to keep you on your toes. You bring in your note cards. You can bring in your, um, I th the source book is okay, but I don't think, you, well, if you want to bring Rudowski in, just don't copy from him, please. Uh, if you have some things, I'd rather you put Rudowski on note cards uh, if you have something you want from Rudowski. Uh, I think it would be healthier for you and all of us. So, because otherwise we just start copying the stuff out of Rudowski and that's not a good idea. Okay, so what we're going to have is something to do with the ba historical backgrounds that I covered, which was a long discussion from prehistory through the Middle Ages up to the condition of Jews in the ghetto uh, on the eve of emancipation. That will be some area of one question. I can't tell exactly what I haven't even thought to decide yet. Uh, how can I tell you? The other, another question will be on the emancipation from the ghettos, and particularly the literature of people like Mendelssohn. Dispute with, um, who was that minister that he disputed with? Dome was on his side. The other minister, Lavater, the Lavater letter and stuff like that that I read you. So these are things that we might, and of course a philosophical description, if you like, descriptions of philosophy of Mendelssohn's work and what it means and so on. And then finally this material. 
this further extension of Mendelssohn into Reform Judaism, into Science of Judaism school, into the reaction of the historical school, and what we now call conservative Judaism. So that is a third area that I would ask you to express yourselves in. So two out of three of those is what you'll have to do. Any questions? That's it, kiddos. Sorry to be. Oh, I don't care. Uh, well, just make a big, huge sheets of paper, okay? <laughs> <laughs>